today at least one thing which i had on my mind uh, that i wanted to you know maybe have a little bit discussion on is uh, around um, the cross chain linking and my understanding is this will become really big because individual blockchains that they that don't talk to each other is just not how the world will be this is the world of uh, aols and the computer and those uh, uh, i would say island of internet that used to exist 25 30 years ago right today i think the blockchains like bitcoin blockchain ethereum blockchain solana blockchain cardano blockchains polka dots uh they don't talk to each other then if that's the case then there is a lot of value that we will not be able to realize uh if these blockchains continue to operate in an island right so um imagine if we are having a phone uh and uh there are a different the wifi providers um have a they don't talk to each other so you moving from your home you go into starbucks man that the wifi doesn't work there because hey it's a different uh, provider that's not how uh, you know if the wifi would have been in that uh condition we wouldn't have seen the whole widespread use of it so i think it will take some time but blockchains will become interoperable and uh, there is already uh, projects going around that there are some blockchains which are focused uh, on interoperability and uh, but there is something that i um uh um one project i want to talk about um which i didn't think that they were big in interoperability but uh, i was anyway interested in that for some other reasons so we will we will talk about that samuel says are you talking about helium uh no helium well, actually there's a good news on helium you know that hit very close to close to home so helium provides um, low bandwidth internet connections lower bandwidth wifi connection um through um you know a network of uh, nodes that are run by individuals right so if you go back and look at helium network um, people's network so as an individual i can go and buy this little device this is called hnt uh, sorry hnt is a token this these are the helium devices and i can plug this in into my uh, with uh, plug a lan cable into this my ethernet cable into this voila i got this a little bit of a mining machine which also provides a wifi connection and uh, now there are overall these are hotspots overall now 209000 hotspots now this is has grown really pretty quick if i recall when did we do the helium uh, deep dive in here did we do helium uh, i remember talking about helium oh, i'm just trying to find out where was that okay i don't have it here oh no we did it on 7 we did it in july we did a deep dive on helium and at that point of a time helium had what how many hotspots oh where did the okay there is the doc, helium documentation oh, did i move it somewhere else okay if i recall correctly they had uh, close to i i can't remember that helium is i think around 80000 hotspots in july when we first looked at helium and uh, now it's like 209000 so this is 
uh, growing rapidly. Also, we saw a very San Jose. There was a news that San Jose wants to fund uh, the internet for low income households using Helium network. So now we are actually seeing some real world use case of a crypto company. Um, you know, the service that they provide is being you could be used by um, you know uh, the mayor or or the San Jose authorities. So, so the, that's what the mayor told that they will install 20 helium compatible hotspots with volunteer residents and small businesses. I guess probably they will pay, um, yeah, aim to give 1300 participant households want a payment of $120 that they can use to pay for low cost internet for a year. Yeah. And so for now the pilot, it's a pilot program for 1300 households and $120 per year for an internet, which, will be provided by um, a group of volunteers who will have these helium hotspots, which I guess the San Jose uh, city government will sponsor and give it to these volunteers and the small businesses. And uh, the uh, businesses, they will mine h and tokens as well. Right, so this is just a pilot. Uh, let's see how much, uh, you know, how successful could this be? Uh, till now, the helium was the helium network was only for low latency but very low bandwidth use case. But with the new uh, hotspots which rely on 5G, uh, things could be different. You could actually maybe able to get at some decent amount of a bandwidth uh, through the helium network itself. In that case, you know, this is really, I'm really then uh, excited about this project. This is a real world use case of a project, which makes me exciting about it. All right, so no, so what I was talking about uh, was around the cross chains. So before we get into those details of cross chains, let's look at what's happening. Um, today seems to be a good day. Go back around seven days. It might just seem red. Well, this website is slow. So maybe I should switch to the coin gecko. I think that's it. Yeah things, uh, not too much of a difference, uh, you know, at least the, the bigger cryptos have been within the this band of price range and been fluctuating here and there, despite all what happened around the China, uh, didn't affect much. But again, those who have been watching the on-chain analytics are still bullish around, uh, especially around the Bitcoin. Time will tell whether they have a crystal ball or not but uh, not much going around on from a, a price perspective, I would say. A lot of things happening from a technology perspective. Uh, price will take care of it itself later on. So uh, if you have questions, if you want to bring up a topic, uh, just you know, put it in the chat or you know we can start talking about it. Otherwise, okay. So I didn't yeah. understand uh, the the person who spoke last week. He said he bought some helium hotspots and then he sold it. So, so how can you use it? So so you can actually go and buy this uh, helium hotspot from this company. Uh, and once you buy this, you'll right now all these things probably are back ordered. They are in huge demand. So okay. it might take a few months for it to arrive. Once it arrives, you can basically plug in, put your ethernet connection um, cable in this, and then it starts to mine 
and your uh, HNT token. And I guess along with this, you'll get an app also. So you can see how many HNTs you are, uh, has it been mining for you? So the gentleman last week, what he was telling that he bought in a helium uh, hotspot, but then uh, later on it's so late. Uh, and he was talking about, I think, not now, he sold it probably quite early. And, uh, but then the helium, I don't know, price have been fluctuating uh, on the on the helium side. So for example, if you had bought helium, uh, these hotspots here, and I've been mining this and collecting HNT tokens, at the start of the year, those tokens were what, $1.43? Now those are worth almost $18. So there are two ways to collect all these some, you know, crypto tokens especially the ones which, which are mineable, either you mine them or you just buy them off the exchange. And so if you want, you can go to Coinbase or whatever exchange these Helium tokens are traded on. It's not on Coinbase, but it's on Binance US. You can buy HND on that exchange or you can get this mining gear, the hotspot, which also serves as a mining gear uh, and use that to mine and generate Helium but the hotspot has some cost. So I think that's what he was referring to. He bought it, then he sold it again. And now the Helium project has grown really big. And that's why the HNT token price has grown really big. So I think that, that was a discussion. All right, so let's, uh, any, anything else or so, or any other topic you want to bring up for discussion or want to talk about? If no, I will uh, continue to share some charts and uh, we'll also do a little deeper dive into Chainlink today because I was excited when I read about Chainlink. Um, in my opinion, I think that's uh, one of the undervalued projects. Again, it's not a financial advice, but I, I, it, it, in, I say in my opinion, because I used to undervalue it. I thought they were uh, running, they were doing one thing, but now I realize Chainlink is doing too many things. So I thought I'll, I'll share with you. I spent some time to understand Chainlink. So if you say, so it's running using electricity in your home constantly, what if it gets interrupted? So it is using two things. Number one, the electricity, number two, the internet connection. So if you're using Comcast, it will basically either take a slice of your Comcast connection to generate Wi-Fi signals. So if, uh, if it gets interrupted, it gets interrupted. I, I don't know in term, uh, whether there are, I don't think that there are any penalties, et cetera, for it. So if it gets interrupted, interrupted and you are not able to provide a service, then you won't be, um, uh, be able to earn those h and uh, rewards. So there are, oh, let me see if I can find while I talk, let me also do a search to find out where the helium is. So there are a few ways in which you can uh, earn these tokens, I would say. One is of course, uh, you mine it. Then, okay, there it is. Then you could also become a moderator. So let's go back here. What are the various ways? Oh, yeah, there was 80,000, 81,000 as of July hotspots. And today we are in end of September. So July, August, September, three months. It's almost two and a half times. It's 209,000 um, hotspots now. Yeah, so... You basically, if you hold that device, you make uh, money in these ways. Number one, you perform a role of challenger. You perform a role of challenging and witness. This is uh, make sure that there is proof of coverage means someone is providing a Wi-Fi coverage. The other one is using how much of your Wi-Fi data is being used by the customers. And the third one is a consensus group. So these are the three ways you make money. 
uh, on Helium Network. Uh, then the app gives the interface to uh, how much token you're mining, who keeps track of you, you received in mining. So I think when you uh, register your hotspot on their Helium network, you have to register your hotspot on the Helium network and then uh, you can know from your account in terms of how many HNTs have you generated. And then you want, you can sell it on the exchange, right? Each HNT, it's a tradable, token on exchanges, right? Not trading at $18. So you, if you want, you can sell it on, on the exchange, just like the Bitcoin, Bitcoin miners do. They mine the Bitcoin, and when they have to fund their CapEx and OpEx, they'll basically go and sell it uh, and to fund their operations. Or if they want to hodl it, they'll hodl it. That depends on what's your outlook on the Helium. But uh, this is people's powered network. Yeah. All right, so where were we? Um, ah. Yeah, Zifty, let me know if, if there is any other question. It might be easier to maybe unmute and, and talk through it. I mean, I'm okay with it, as long as you're okay with it. So an interesting chart uh, I pull in today, uh, artwork tokens. Samuel, is there like artwork means you're talking about NFTs or is there a chain called artwork? Because anything is possible in this wild, wild west. Okay, NFTs. Yeah, I am not uh, being on NFTs, but I mean, it's uh, the value lies in the eyes of the beholder. Let me put it that way. Um, yeah, you can buy it only through crypto. Uh, most of the NFTs will price themselves in on most of them. Uh, the NFT platforms are on Ethereum blockchain. So they price themselves in ETH. So you have to have that ETH um, load it into your MetaMask wallet. Create your account on any of the NFT exchanges. OpenSea is the most famous one on Ethereum blockchain. And then there is a Rarible, if I recall correctly. Yes, there is Rarible too. This is also an NFT exchange. And then I think Solana has their own, and now Binance has their own NFT exchange on different blockchains. So if you're interested in collecting these uh, digital artwork, um, then yeah, you could do it. I think there is some authentic. So, so right now, it, it blows my mind that some of these artwork is like two hundred thousand dollars, three hundred thousand dollars. People are willing to pay that much amount of amount of money to buy these NFTs. But I guess they perceive some value in it. And uh, if based on what Twitter has, Twitter came out uh, last week uh, or this week, I, uh, I'm losing the, the track of the time, but Twitter made two big announcements uh, for the crypto world, right? I think probably it was last week because we talked about one of them, which is that they will enable um, the payment of tips using Bitcoin through the Lightning Network. And uh, my thesis was that this is just a start from Twitter. Right? It could very well evolve into a, into a remittance business, right? And not just tip, but I could just use it to remit money to, um, uh, to foreign countries and don't have to pay that hefty price to Western unions of, of the world, right? So that's that's a huge um, news in, in my opinion. Right? Tipping may not be that big business, but if you can tip it, and uh, then there is no uh, there is no reason why your tip can't be you know twenty thousand dollars. If I have a if I want to send it to some of my friend or my family in and, and remit some payment, 
You could still use the same um, network, could still use the same infrastructure, but rather than sending $5, you're just sending $10,000. So that's one which Twitter had announced. The other important thing which Twitter has announced, and that is with respect to NFTs, is uh, Twitter is working on a project in which if, and probably I will never be using it because I don't use NFT. So in which if, for example, on my profile, I have my picture. Instead of this, if I have an NFT here, Twitter will be able to authenticate that I am indeed an owner of that NFT. I think that's going to be huge because now this gives me a bragging platform to say, hey, I actually am owner of that NFT, uh, which is, um, I think it's, it's on Solana, um, both, was a crazy uh, NFT is uh, very popular on Solana. No, I I can't remember that name. Oh, we talked about it earlier. NFTs. Oh. Um, anyway, so at the end of the day, you know, these, some of these NFTs become, it, it's a JPEG, right? So, and let's say, let's look at this, these piglets. I could still download this at my place and upload this as my Twitter profile. But Twitter won't verify me. But now if Twitter actually goes through with this project that they're working on, that they will be able to verify it and confirm it through the blockchain that the NFT, which I am showing in my profile, I am indeed the rightful owner of it that actually can make a lot of value on, of holding this NFT, right? Otherwise, yeah, I, I hold that NFT, but I don't have any bragging rights. There is no plat, you know, there is no platform where I can go and tell and, and someone will confirm, yeah, that I'm indeed the owner, right? But now if Twitter does that, I got a bragging rights. Twitter is confirming that, hey, I own an NFT. It's like if I own an expensive piece of art for my own internal satisfaction, if I want to own it, I can own it and you know put it in the garage. No one looks at it. But most of the people don't own it for that reason. They own it so that they can show their neighbors and tell the rest of the world that they own that piece of art. That's why they will be prominently put in the drawing room. In case of NFTs, everyone can have a JPEGs added to their profile. But if Twitter is going to authenticate, and then that does make, uh, gives some legitimacy mercy, and could be bullish for these NFTs. At least there is one way in which you could use this to brag about whatever your status or whatever, right? Uh, but I do see um, the other one around the, this NBA, Top shots, in which which is a good business for the NBA is to maybe take a slices of your videos and sell it, sell the ownership rights to other people. Right? So I think that's there's a business around it. Third one around NFTs is your music albums. Today the artists get paid very small percentage of the overall value that, you know, when I buy a digital music, if I buy it on, on iTunes for a dollar, the actual artists get paid probably less than 10 cents. Right? But if we have the, uh, this NFT platform, uh, we can cut down on some of those, uh, the record labels and all that, uh, there's a genuine use for those kind of NFTs. Right now, these piggy NFTs and board apes NFT, that was the name I was trying to remember on, I think, Solana. The board ape NFTs, uh, that's, that's more of a fun. So, 
and those ETH rocks, or maybe there is some sentimental value attached to that ETH rocks. Those who have been uh, uh, the part of that uh, cypherpunk uh, movement and probably can relate to some of these things. Yeah, there is some value. I, again, I think when it comes to art, the value lies in the eyes of beholder. So I may not be, I, I probably won't have any sentimental value for these piglets or, or ether rock. Someone might have. Uh, Mr. Mr. says, watch for Twitter to address digital identification. Yeah. So it's interesting to see if uh, it's going to be Twitter or is there going to be any other blockchain project? Because right now the online ID, yeah, I mean, generally on the, on the crypto side, we are anti-identification, right? The moment you talk about doing KYC on a project, um, people start to, to back off from those. But if we really has to make it uh, a, a real commerce and start using these DeFi's in our real life and connect with the financial institutions, I think digital identification is must. So, uh, yeah. Maybe I missed that around the, what Twitter is doing in terms of digital identification. But if they are doing something, that's a that's a great great news. I mean, we, and Twitter has been in forefront around, uh, especially Jack Dorsey has been forefront in terms of a whole decentralized form. Right? They've been working on a decentralized version of Twitter. It's like Twitter trying to disrupt themselves. I think Open Sky or Blue Sky is the code name of that project. Because he knows if not now, but two years down the line, there will be a decentralized version of Twitter. So why not us create the decentralized version? This is saying we are going to understand that economic or business uh, craze for the NFTs. Yeah, like these probably could be craze, but there are some real use cases of the NFTs. But they don't make big news. Right, so the news come from when people are buying pigs or bored apes. Uh, uh, th those make news. Uh, you fear using NFT to create a or a digital certificate, or maybe I mean there are not many projects on that right now. Or maybe putting your uh, mod gate or, or your house deed. Who's in, I mean, that doesn't make big news. But anyway, we don't have that infrastructure supporting uh, right now anyway. Uh, Mr. Mr. says, in my opinion, the current craze around digital art will become a moment of time. Movement in time for ES721, other chain NFTs. Yeah. The traditional value of NFT is the real, ability to tie real world asset to the digital proof. Form. Exactly. Right, you know, not, I mean, there are, there's work happening, but that's where we will have a, uh, we will find the real value of NFTs. Boarding passes. It's an NFT. It's non-fungible. It looks like the same. Your boarding pass and my boarding pass will look like the same, but it is not the same. Or um, you know, university certificates or medical certificates. There are a lot of an application of NFTs. But It'll take a decade for us to get there. Uh, we also have to make sure that there are corresponding laws governing it, that, that these are acceptable. If challenged, there has to be a path of, you know, how the law will view these things, right? That is why it will take for these real world use cases to come up. But this meantime, you can enjoy with these pigs photos. Yeah, fractional commodity ownership. Yeah. So, so I am particularly excited about this uh, NFTs as a concept, but I think it probably will come in in the music sector. We'll start seeing coming in the music. Already, it's the part of the artwork. Then slowly move into the music, and then you know the other real, uh, it's generally called RWAs, real world assets. Right. They'll start to securitize, they'll start to securitize those real world assets and as NFTs onto the blockchain 
And then we will have all these use cases of fractional ownership and you know, easy transferable of ownership mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Um, uh, you know, disintermediation of, of escrow companies. And, but we need to have a regulatory framework. We need to have a, a, to define, you know, and, and agree on how the, if it's challenged, how it gets challenged, how the laws will view it. So that, that will take a huge amount of time. Right now, we don't even know whether a particular um, coin is a security or not. We are like at, st at step zero. There is no particular definition from SEC on how they view a particular asset as a, whether it's a security or whether it's a commodity. But they say, yeah, we'll challenge you. They did with Coinbase. We'll, we'll challenge you. We'll enforce it through regulations, whereas the regulations are not even clear. I mean, there's no clarity um, at, at the very basic level. So it's, it's a long-term project, right? Uh, this, at least 20 years, we need to have our horizon as long as 20 years. Uh, we are very early in this game. So uh, I looked at this chart today from, again, from Glassnode. Long-term holder supply, which is in light green. So based on whatever you saw uh, last week, after the whole China uh, trying to curb uh, this whole uh, uh, crypto transactions. And this time China is actually more serious than what we have seen it uh, in, in previous instances. So this long-term holders, they started to accumulate. The supply started going up. The one here is the short-term holders. They started to sell. So basically the short-terms were selling, long-term holders were buying. Uh, that's what this tells us is happening. Um, has happened in you know last few months. So from uh, if we want to really analyze it from looking at this, looks like these long term holders really have a long term view, and short term holders are trading in and out of crypto. Uh, long term holders generally buy on the weakness. So last few months, there's been an accumulation on the, from the long term holders perspective. And, uh, and sell into strength to speculators, short-term holders buy strength and sell into weakness, or they just hold and become long-term owners. Yeah, so that's what the, it was actually by the dip. I have another chart, I'll come back to this later. So crypto assets flows, week to week numbers, they were actually became positive. And, and this is from, uh, I, I think of a, of a institutional uh, flows. So for last few weeks, it was positive. So while the individual uh, investors or uh, short-term holders or speculators or traders were selling out, uh, the institutions and the so-called whales were actually buying it. Uh, they got cheaper, so why not? And uh, if I recall correctly, the numbers, um, I was listening to on a podcast while taking my evening walk. And, and that's what I do. My evening walk uh, is dedicated to catch up. You know, I dedicate that while to, to catch up on some of these uh, happenings around the crypto and the, and the stock world. So I was listening and uh, if I recall correctly, in this, the China, so the over the last few weeks, not, not even China, I think before that, the whole weakness that we've been seeing in crypto markets, almost 60,000 Bitcoins have been accumulated by whales. Those whales means the addresses that have thousand or more Bitcoins, those wallets have thousand or more Bitcoins. So uh, they've been like sitting tight. It could be El Salvador, I don't think they have a thousand yet. I think they bought 500 earlier. Then they bought a few more, but who knows? We could have buy a little more. But the whole idea is, uh, yeah, 
someone was selling but and some long term holders they were buying into the dip so depending on your outlook uh, we can decide what we want to do the other one which i like is blockfi blockfi sent me an email saying starting october 1st your apy is being increased when did you last get an email which says that we're going to increase your apy okay. uh, doesn't happen with the traditional banks first of all these numbers you don't even, you don't even see in uh, traditional banks so this is good i mean 8% 8% not bad 8.25% even better it's so uh, I'm happy uh, with whatever BlockFi is giving. Of course, it comes with its own risk around regulatory risk, which BlockFi is currently going through. We'll see uh, what eventually happens to it. But the state of New Jersey, they have been postponing their uh, order for a banning um, BlockFi to service new jersey customers i do, i think they cannot there are four or five states uh, which have given cease and desist order means they cannot take new customers on those four or five states uh, but they um, beyond that uh, they can continue to serve the existing customers I, california is not one of them so if you're in california they will still happily take you as a customer but in I don't know whom regulators are trying to protect. As an individual investor, I'm pretty happy with this. Uh, of course, my bank is not happy because the money moved out of my bank account and into BlockFi and into Celsius. Right? So obviously they won't be happy. So everyone is trying to put pressure from their own side to protect their own skin. So this was a good happy news to see. Okay, someone is actually increasing uh, um, uh, APY. Okay. Uh, what else? Uh, yeah, a quick history on the China ban. You know, this this puts some perspective into why the long term holders continue to buy. You know, because those who have been in this industry for years, probably have seen this story multiple times. Uh, Mr. Sir, I'm building a DeFi product that will offer 2x to 3x block for your returns. Uh, oh, that's great. Um, the only thing is because some of the DeFi uh, projects, most of them have a variable uh, rates. So I'm looking for someone who can give actually some fixed rates, which will be great. I know some of the other, um, who is that person? Um, I forgot. Uh, James, uh, he hasn't joined today. And James is working, um, I think he's in a company, uh, his startup where they are trying to build a fixed rate uh, DeFi product. But yeah, uh, most of them are highly variable because there is a risk involved in it, right? So, so not sure, Mister Mister, what you are building, but uh, yeah, we'll be happy to try and, and have a look at it. If you want to uh, bring me a separate message, give a URL to your website. I'm exploring, trying to look. I mean, I I use uh, our way to do some lending and and borrowing. A uh, little bit on curve uh, as well, but uh, that's it. And then I use Celsius and Block Five. All right, so uh, a quick look into the history of this whole China ban. It's not the first time, right? So 2009, Bitcoin was 10 thousandths of a cent. Six months after it was invented, China announced that it would prohibit virtual currencies. I had no idea at that point of a time what Bitcoin was. Uh, 
and the the desire of the chinese government was to prevent gamers from using in game money to purchase real world goods so they said we'll prohibit all virtual currencies four years later 2013 btc is a 900 dollars people bank of china prohibits chinese banks from engaging in bitcoin related businesses individuals you can still trade prices of bitcoin drops Baidu stopped accepting BTC, crypto exchange BTC China is unable to accept yuan deposits because banks are not allowed to provide service to crypto uh, exchanges. So BTC can't become a, you can transfer your yuan to, to crypto exchange. 2014, BTC at 850. Again, uh, Alibaba follows Baidu leaves ban Bitcoin transactions. 2017, 4,000. China plan to shutter all Bitcoin exchanges. 2021, they started shutting down the miners. So this is when we started reviewing it. Uh, we started having these meetups. We talked about it, how the whole mining hash power transfer, it moved out of China and have some of have come to, mostly has come to North America. Some has gone to uh, Kazakhstan and some other places. The great hash rate migration and then now in september they retrade restrictions on the trading and mining but i think this time one difference is uh, they also want to shut down the over-the-counter trading so the exchanges have been shut down since 2017 but folks were still able to trade uh, through the over-the-counter uh, trading desks but now what this time is a little more serious little more uh, trying to close down all more loopholes is not only of course exchanges were never there now they're trying to shut down the odc uh, desks also if you are a foreign exchange you cannot provide services to chinese residents so, so earlier the uh, exchanges that were based out of China, they were not allowed to. So most of the exchanges moved out of China and registered themselves in some other countries and were still able to serve Chinese uh, citizens or residents. But now they also want to restrict uh, even that. So this time it is a little more serious, but I guess looking at what's been happening over years, so, okay. Bitcoin didn't even care. I mean, the whole crypto industry, they didn't even care. So earlier at such an announcement, the, the industry would be down, especially the, the leader, Bitcoin would be down 10, 15%. This time, not much. So again, China wants to do it because there is a risk of capital flight. It's a controlled capital. There's no free convertibility of capital uh, uh, in China. So they don't want to make sure that the dollars are, you know, the uh, loan fly out of China. So that's one. The other one is CBDCs. China is leading the world in terms of the national CBDCs. Right? Digital Yuan, digital renminbi. They have done, at least last I tracked, and then I stopped tracking because they are so far ahead of any other country. They did two pilot projects of uh, the digital uh, yuan in which the residents of a particular area, just like El Salvador has done with, if you have a wallet, you get $30 in Bitcoin currency. So in China, if you were part of those selected uh, province or, or area, and maybe I'm not probably using the right term, but uh, that selected area, and you have that app, you basically get a free digital yuan from Chinese government. And then you can go and uh, make purchases using that. And now many of these online retailers have started accepting it. It's a big game. China is already forging all that economic cooperation group, RECP, Regional Economic Cooperation, whatever that P is, right? US is not part of that, but that's a 
biggest trading group uh, in the world and the uh, chinese the biggest player like if uh, mr mr charambi global reserve at 2030 that's exactly what they want to do make it easier for the countries who are doing business with china uh, for them to use rmb i don't know whether it will become a global reserve or not because people need to have a faith on the legal power behind uh, rmb and right now that's a reputation risk which chinese government has so but then hold their uh, silk and belt road initiative bri the belt road initiative wherein the chinese government is doing infrastructure projects across many countries in asia they could work it out saying hey instead of uh, trading in dollars let's trade only in uh, digital rmb so eventually that's what they want to do and uh, trading in this remnimbe becomes pretty smooth less costly it's all digital that's what their game plan is so also it gives them a it uh, makes the the government's grip on their citizens even firmer if i were to use cash is the most anonymous form of currency i'm not saying it feds or us fed says it right cash is the most anonymous form bitcoin or virtual currency is the second one so if suddenly the paper or, or the coinage disappears from china and every citizen has to only use the cbdc the government knows where you spend single you know each rmb so they give it kind of a a little scary scenario also so so because everything will be accessible to uh, the chinese authorities number two it's a digital currency can be wiped off any time as well so it doesn't become really scary so i think from a us perspective that is why we are trading it so slowly to figure out what can government will have access to and what not uh but chinese government is pushing through it and they want to many want to make sure that instead of holding dealing with other digital currencies the citizens only deal in cbdc in which they have a control they have complete visibility and uh a little bit of a disturb i hope that it situation doesn't come to that but um uh, vivek you know say so so got to be a little scared around that yeah vivek in 19 uh, 2005 i was taking an mba course from this um accounting uh, i guess accounting professor genius from korea mm -hmm. what he said was a checks is very backwards the checks checks. checks yeah it's very backwards and uh 15 years later we're still using checks in money orders you know and uh china i can't even i can't even um buy uh, about uh 8 years ago i couldn't even buy anything online any longer with cash or visa oh, yeah. My, yeah so yeah, uh, what i'm talking about is checks the the how backward the us is oh yes yeah. so, so us is so uh, again i think us is far behind in terms of uh, online payments and uh, china is far ahead and now i think india has in terms just in terms of the number of payments it's a different matter because india's india's and us so china and india has got huge population uh, so the number of uh, transaction digital transactions obviously is way way higher than what happens in in us So US the problem is US has got a lot of these incumbents who are trying to protect their turf right so this is banks and all that stuff but uh, China the like this uh, the apps from Alibaba WeChat you could do everything on those super apps and uh, some of my friends from mainland China they like everything is digital i mean there is no need to hold any cash for you to or car for that matter 
All you need is your Alipay app and you can survive really well. I don't think we can do that in US yet. So you're right, uh, US is far behind in terms of digital adoption, um, uh, you know, adoption of digital uh, electronic cash. Let me put it that way. I'm not even talking about this digital or crypto assets. Just from an electronic cash perspective, we are far behind. And now these visas and the MasterCards and the financial institutions, you know, JP Morgan Chase and the Bank of Americas, now they are trying to protect their turf and we will see you know, how regulators are coming behind now stable coins and how they would want to regulate this crypto economy. Eventually lawmakers get funded by companies and depending on who is taking money from which industry, they will try to push in their own agenda. Right? We, there's already in this infrastructure bill, there's already, uh, not crypto friendly um, statements included uh, in it um, were added by one senator because the senator gets most of the election funding from insurance companies. Now, if you got uh, DeFi's uh, become popular, the stable coins become very popular, you know, why would I use my banking services? I already moved. Or money Another from thing. banking account to these DeFi's and and to block uh, block fi and Celsius. They are not DeFi. They are still centralized. But at least in the crypto economy, you know. So. So the, Another the, thing, when they use Alipay or WeChat Pay, they don't pay the uh, two to three percent uh, fee yeah, to the exactly. bank. So uh, actually, the uh, customer gets credit. So Ross says MasterCard jumped uh, into BNPL today. Uh, I think that was yesterday or day before, whatever. But yeah, uh, a different discussion, not related to crypto, but I am seeing that the companies that are in BNPL are moving into other areas. There was a separate news that a firm will now start to offer cards or some deposit accounts. I'll have to go back and look at it. I'll, I thought I'll talk about it in the Saturday meeting. So I have yet to prepare the document. And uh, we see this traditional uh, square is already jumped into BNPL. MasterCard is jumping into BNPL. Yeah. But I think like Mr. Mr. says, times of banks, it has to be. They, they have to wake up to what the reality is. It's um, This Jenny, you, you, you know, lawmakers can't put this back in the bottle. They can probably will kill it. It's not going back in the bottle. So it's good. I appreciate you guys probably are in, in the forefront. We are a rare breed who is looking into this crypto economy at the very beginning when it's still shaking, taking shape. Zifti says, can people in China trade cryptos or just banned from mining? So right now, they are even banned from trading. So uh, Huobi Exchange will now start to deplane or stop providing services to um, people in China. I think many of these exchanges have already outlined that by which date they will stop servicing the customers in China. Uh, uh, this coin gecko, so forget about the exchanges. I think Alibaba had stopped uh, listing the mining gears because Chinese government has told any you shouldn't be supporting anything related to digital currency. So Alibaba has removed the listing of you know all these uh, ASICs miners and all of the mining equipment. Um, Coin Gecko, the website that we used, just now to look at uh, the exchanges. If you are in China and not using a VPN to fake your location. Uh, this is not accessible in China. I think so is the case with coin market cap. They are not accessible from from within the China within China. Uh, so Zifti, to answer a question, uh, people are banned from tr from transacting in cryptos. Now the last portion, and I don't know when that government will do, is ban people even from holding it. So today. It becomes the same thing like 
uh, wealthy Chinese um, citizens. They basically get out of China and buy some property or you know something that they can't do within China and buy the stuff and go back to China because the holding is not prohibited. So right now, if you are already holding Bitcoin or any of the digital uh, assets, that's not banned. But who knows? So if you look at the step-by-step, step, the way China has proceeded, first got the banking services, reduced the exposure of banking services from this crypto economy by, ban by banning them to provide any services to crypto. Then uh, get the miners out. Now, even not allowing the foreign exchanges to serve the residents of China, now the last step is what happened to those who are actually holding the assets. Will the holding of assets also could be banned? Who knows? Right. So that that will be the last step. Or start IP stealing uh, IP stealing companies uh, in US. Uh, that's been happening for for decades now. Banned because China censors uh, are not effective. Yeah, people will find a way to get around those uh, senses. But one good thing, one positive thing out of this is maybe that talent and the capital will now flow out of China and US got an opportunity. So last year, a lot of lawmakers had this whole concern around this Bitcoin becoming big thing is, oh, China controls it. Most of the miners are located in China. A lot of development is happening out of China. Mostly Chinese people trade in it. So US should not, so US government should ban it. We are far behind China. China is so far ahead of us. Now, within a year, that narrative has completely changed. Now, it's no miners left in China. So the concern was that if China uh, can control all the miners, then they will have a control over the uh, Bitcoin blockchain. You know, they can reverse the transactions because if they control the most of the hash power, they could do 15% attack. Probably. So these were some of these excuses given, right? So now within a year, the, the scenario has completely changed. So I feel this is really good for, for US. We just, our lawmakers need to wake up and take advantage of this situation. The great companies of today, which have generated tremendous amount of wealth in the market. Okay. Facebook has not generated social wealth, but they've generated a lot of uh, stock market wealth. They all have come from the technology that China had banned. China have created their own islands. They have their own version of, uh, of those, their own version of Facebook, own version of Google, which is Baidu, uh, own version of, um, you know, all other, uh, these um, internet based apps that you cannot, um, so that China has blocked from other to provide services. I mean, US markets and the US economy has benefited a lot. So, so uh, this is a good sign. This is an opportunity. I hope some sense prevails in our leadership uh, and uh, we take advantage of it. China is reversing decades of capitalism trends. I think this, to me, in my opinion, this was probably really thought out strategy from uh, Xi Jinping is let's feed these pigs, let's feed these tech giants, let them make money, and then we basically slaughter them or make use of them. And that's what it has been happening now. Anyway, uh, this is not about China. So the reason we started talking about with all this, this China ban we have seen many times. I uh, see it's uh, the top of R. So let's spend some time talking about cross-chain communications. Like I was saying during the start of the discussion, this, is in my opinion is really very important having a cross blockchain communication 
we cannot have islands of uh, blockchain that don't talk to each other. And then there are many projects that whose main focus is that we provide cross blockchain communications, right? Polkadot recently is trying to build a consensus on the cross consensus message format XCM. Again, whoever controls the standard or who, who's, whichever company's standard is adopted will become very powerful, uh, adopted widely. Right? So Polkadot, everyone knows that they're working on it. Then there are smaller projects who basically will take an asset from one blockchain and then move it to another blockchain. Um, some of them get hacked as well. I think that's what are that $600 million, $650 million hack that happened a couple of months ago was uh, around that project. But one project that caught me by surprise uh, because I was, an, I was only focused on one particular area for that particular company is Chainlink. So, yeah, Mr. Mr. Said, yes, Chainlink. Uh, so Chainlink, I, I knew about Chainlink, but I knew about it it's an, as an Oracle service. Right? It provides us with an information from the outside world, from the non-crypto world, and uh, gather that information in a, in a decentralized way uh, and dependable way for it to be used on blockchain projects. But then I started digging deeper into Chainlink. It's not just Oracle, that's just one part of it. It's got a keeper network. It allows interoperability between blockchains, which is gonna be huge. And lastly, fourth business, uh, if I can call it as a business unit, is provides verifiable random functions. And so I spend a little more time and I want to have that discussion, maybe invite your thoughts on what do you think about Chainlink? Right? Then when I started looking into this, I was like, hmm, I was already, I, I, I like that project. I already bullish on Chainlink just because of the Oracle services. I see more and more projects making use of chain link for uh, getting external world data. But now these three, especially these two, Keeper Network and Interoperability, I mean, man, that's great. So I spent some time trying to figure out, okay, what the heck this is doing. And uh, that it was a good opportunity, you know, to continue building position on, on chain link. Again, not a investment advice, but it, it helps that if you, you know, we can do a little more study and build our conviction in our, around it. Till now my conviction was around Oracle services, but there are a few more things. Mr. Mr. also Chainlink, exactly. And I wasn't aware, uh, maybe I didn't pay enough attention, you know, and being a retail uh, investor, who's got a separate day job, I only get to spend only so much amount of a time to keep myself up to date on the crypto and on the stock world. And I missed that chain link is actually getting bigger in interoperability. Combine that with their already connections that they made through the Oracle services, right? Now you start to put your investor hat and start to analyze when we analyze the stocks on whom hmm, you get your foot into the company through the Oracle and then that are, you can keep selling them, upselling and crossing a lot of other services. So let's spend some time on, uh, on chain. Let me ask you, is everyone familiar with Chainlink or will it be good if I go through Chainlink? I, I was pretty excited about it. Should I go well, through Well, we're Chainlink? actually using it, so. Uh... <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, I think you, you believe yeah, in my product, you have to use it. <laughs> yeah, the uh, Oracle, we're using the Oracle part, but we're also looking into um, the Keeper network. Okay. Um, but but that's a little bit clunky to use, uh, to be honest. <laughs> so this is, um, so, yeah, I think Dave, this is where the, the, the fun comes in because uh, you guys are actually practitioners and can 
give us more insight into you know what this is and how this you know what are other competitors etc yeah you do have to keep uh, some link uh, which i i don't know like it, it's not as uh, smooth as uh, the okay. oracle integration obviously but but it 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 it, it works right um do they have the any cross chain i don't the okay. cross chain i don't know that one we're kind of looking because we do have to um we do have to do the the uh multiple chains eventually mm -hmm. in the l2s um and we're trying to uh do cross-chain governance right that's one yeah. of the things that we're looking into yeah. yeah so all right so let me you know quickly go through this uh, for the benefit of others around around what all chain link is and why i'm excited about this particular project right it doesn't get too much of a media coverage. Most of the media coverage will come to board apes and uh, maybe Bitcoin and Ethereum, but uh, this is a particularly exciting project, uh, a chain link. So uh, let's spend quick some 10, 15 minutes. Is that okay? Or anyone else have any, want to talk about anything? I mean, this is the last topic that I had thought that I'll, I'll discuss, but I'm open to, uh, to talk about if you want to talk about something else or some other project okay ross says yes okay so all right let's talk about what chain link is uh, a brief background on uh, like i was talking about so today blockchain you can do anything in blockchain but it is every data is within the blockchain but now we are having a lot of use cases like james is building some DeFi app to build a DeFi app, if you need to know what's the interest rates, or let's say what's the, the value of Bitcoin is, the real value, you will have to probably depend on some data feed provider. Right? And James, don't kill me, okay? I'm just, I'll just give some crude examples. <laughs> so, but that's- No, that's, that's fine, that's fine. But that's the case, consuming, right? So- Yeah, consuming Chainlink is not too hard. It's the, if you're actually producing data that's a little, little more involved, um, but consuming is not too bad. So, so these are called Oracle networks, which will bring you the information from real world and give you in a verifiable way, in a decentralized way, so that these the, the developers or these blockchain-based projects can actually make use of that information. So that's how Chainlink actually started uh, uh, as their core business. So some example is, for example, price feed. We just talked about it. If you're building a lending, borrowing product or anything in which you need to know the price of a certain asset, you need to get it in a dependable way, verifiable way, decentralized way. Me, It's not being controlled by any party. It's not being modified. It's not being, even though how much ever we may trust our institutions, leave our London Interbank uh, overnight rate was rigged, right? And now the whole financial system is based many mortgages, uh, not in US, but in, in UK are based on LIBOR rate plus some percent. And then after years, after investigation, we realized that LIBOR, LIBOR rates were rigged. So it can depend on centralized authorities. So price suite is one example. Other example, there is a, okay, weather data. So I know of a company, uh, I'm connected to them on, on LinkedIn, is uh, that company provides the insurance services based on the param based on the weather data. So that company has actually tied up with chain link to provide, to get the weather data so that the insurance companies can now build their premiums or build their models based on how the weather is in a particular place. So I can depend on weather.com to give me that because weather.com is a centralized authority, could be had, blah, blah, blah. All the issues that could be, that are, that generally plague a single source of truth or a centralized source of truth. So what do we use? If I want to build a decentralized app, I need to make sure that it is decentralized in the whole stack, right? So there is no single point or attack vector available uh, for anyone to either corrupt my data or, or you know, provide with the wrong information. So Chainlink, you can get weather data. 
You can get sports data. Say I'm building a, um, a betting uh, app or I'm building a fantasy sports app on a, in a decentralized world. So how do I know which team won in the real world? Right? What are the score in the real world? Who won that bet? Which team won? So that information is available in the real world, but I need to bring it into my smart contract, which resides in a blockchain. I'll use Chainlink. So this is what Chainlink was most famous for. It's called providing this Oracle network, it means Oracle knows everything. So Chainlink knows everything about what's happening in the world and they'll give you the information. So they have customers like Aave, it's a DeFi uh, platform on Ethereum. Synthetics does the, give you synthetic equivalent of the shares. So if Tesla, you can't trade uh, Tesla in say in Hong Kong, but on a synthetic, you can trigger synthetic equivalent of Tesla. Arbol is a, the parametric insurance company that I was earlier talking about. Celsius is again, uh, is a traditional, uh, what give you uh, interest accounts. You can stake your coins or you can transfer your USDC and can generate some, can make some yield. Right? So some of these customers. So right now over 300 projects use their Oracle services. And uh, let me know those who are actually building it. What's the biggest competitor here? Because I am not aware of any worthy or known competitor in Oracle uh, area uh, or, you know, uh, for Chainlink. To me, it looks I like- I see Band, Band would be another one, but Band, I, I do see that being used uh, more for, um, like if you look at uh, some of the Terra projects, Terra like, uh, yeah, like, like, uh, like the mirror, mirror protocol or something, mm -hmm. um, they actually use Band quite a bit. Um, oh, okay for a lot of the uh, uh, price feeds from, from, from like uh, stocks. So they, cause you can, you can actually trade like AMC and Tesla and. Yeah, for and, the, and, the person, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So actually I do see that they're using band uh, uh, more, more, more than uh, link uh, right. for some reason. And I, I know, I think the other blockchains are also building or creating uh, some of these Oracle services, uh, um, uh, but mostly the big, and band, I think someone brought a band a few months ago, uh, but again, I don't see too much of a band coming up in, in media or in terms of the number of projects, but what's a worthy competitor to look into? But my understanding is Chainlink is the biggest, it's 800 pound gorilla in Oracle services. And that's what made me bullish on, on Chainlink. Yeah, I feel like maybe in the future, uh, it's a good idea to look at multiple yeah. sources, Absolutely. right? Because just in case, I mean, uh, oh. I don't know, like. I, uh... <laughs> I'm a big fan of owning a basket for every investment thesis, right? Whether it is stock or whether it is crypto. So uh, it might go against some ethos of crypto because there are a lot of tribalism and maxis in the crypto world. I'm not the one. I generally focus on let's own the basket of it. I don't know, 15 years later, which one will be around or which one may not be. So I don't want to put all everything in, in just one, right? I'll, I'll, I'll own a basket of say stocks in case I'm, uh, uh, interested in, uh, you know, electronic uh, cash, uh, loan square, PayPal, little bit of a Visa, MasterCard, own everything. Uh, if I'm uh, on the blockchain side, similar stuff. Right? Hey, Bitcoin, obviously, it's got a different use case now, store of value. There's no little bit of Ethereum, Polkadot, uh, Cardano's, and Cosmos, uh, Algorand. So I'm with you. We don't know which one will be there, so it's always good to spread the risk. Yeah, so, the um, the uh, uh, there is also MakerDAO has uh, they, they're running their own their own uh, Oracle network. So MakerDAO is not using Link. Okay. Um, they're they're doing uh, their own feeds. 
Um, so I think that, I mean, I don't, I don't, I mean, you can, you can grab it from them if you want. <laughs> like you can grab the press information from MakerDAO if you want. Yeah, I yeah. guess. Um, yeah, so then I think Chainlink started with this and they also started moving into other applications. One is a keeper network. And uh, this, in my opinion, is pretty smart move in terms of uh, if I'm a developer, and, and which I am not, but let's pretend that I am a developer. I want to focus uh, as, a, as a developer, I want to put all my energy into writing the best smart contract, you know, with the best logic, et cetera. And, uh, but if I try to run that, and probably James can talk it in a in more practical way. But if I want to run it, and then I have to start worrying about my infrastructure, how do I uh, execution of that contract, et cetera, that can be offloaded to the Keeper network. So the execution services of the contract can be offloaded to Chainlink's Keeper network. It means some of the, uh, if there's some computations to be done, I don't have to worry too much about it. I can basically use Keeper Network as a service and uh, for, for execution of the contract and get my work done. And I can rather focus on writing the best logic. It's a similar thing uh, like, hey, I don't have to worry about the infrastructure. I can offload to do AWS. And let me focus on creating the best app that for for um, or best website without worrying about how do I scale up the infrastructure. You know, AWS will scale it, scale up or down depending on the load. Uh, did I get the analogy right, James? For for the Keeper network? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But it's it's. Um... For now, I, I, I guess you, you, you don't want to do everything there just because it, it gets pretty expensive. There's always going to be there's always going to be off chain um, uh, stuff that you're going to have to do. Correct. Right. Um, that, that's why there's stuff like the graph, for example. Right. Mm. Uh, that handles a lot of the um, a lot of the, the data mapping indexing stuff. Um, but even though even though uh, the graph is really sucks, uh, it's it's like as a um, it, it's a cool concept, right? But using it is is uh, it, it's like um, it's pretty uh, uh, um, it, it, it it's not very reliable, um, especially the hosted version right okay um like like if you if you've ever used any any app that's based on the graph uh it, it would uh, always um have uh, uh sync issues like it would be like behind a few blocks and then it'll catch up oh. and then maybe in a, in a couple hours it'll be behind again um now now you could run a node but then you're where are you going to run that node you're going to put it on aws again right so like, yeah, you know I'm saying like, worry about, uh, about it. Um, yeah. So so it's like um, so if you do the hosted version, it's really uh, not reliable, and then it, it's good enough for like uh, to for some kind of UI, right? Because mm -hmm. UI, you, it's okay to have a little bit of eventual consistency, um, but it's not good enough for like liquidations, for example. Right, because yeah. that you actually need <laughs> like real time. You can't, it can't be like a ten blocks behind or something. Right. right? Um, yeah. That lies our track vector if it's ten ten blocks behind. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. 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 So so again, I think for for, for the non blockchain or the non uh, devs, it's, it's to understand that hey, we can use it to offload some of the work. But the biggest one, again, the third one is a cross-chain interoperability protocol. And this was a surprise for me because I did not know that the chain is actually eyeing this particular area, right? But now this is a smart way because they're already getting their 
and um, uh, feed into these various companies who are building solutions on different different blockchains. Now they're providing a, a service in which if I run create a smart contract that needs information from multiple different blockchains. The chain link will do the work of transferring. You know, if we build our application as per the CCIP protocol of translating the smart contract from um, and be able to get the values from other blockchain or run it on other blockchain. So, so the whole idea is now we could have a connection between multiple blockchains. This is what Polkadot is trying to do through their XEM uh, uh, consensus format. Again, I think this probably right now we are in a space like VHS versus Betamax. Um, and maybe so people who have dealt with the video cassette recorders probably will recognize these terms. Uh, now the cell phone recorders, they probably won't know it, but uh, right now this is, I think, a race for who defines the protocol and which protocol uh, becomes more widespread in terms of a usage. So CCIP is a standard for developers to easily build secure cross-chain services and applications. So now you could actually create a DeFi applications so today the DeFi applications are logged into that particular blockchain. Right? Uh, you could do yield farming, but then I can order particular blockchains. But now if we have this ability of cross blockchain, you can build applications that could pick up data from one and use into another blockchain, right? It opens up the immense possibilities of what can be built on on internet is like we started with uh, we started the internet with the static web pages then we started adding little more dynamism into the web pages depending on who are you if depending on your profile you could see little different things then but those are still maintained by company but then we started making it more interactive and more rich websites wherein the data is not coming from that only that particular company, but now the web page becomes uh, an amalgamation of a lot of information coming from different sources. You get some data feed from some exchanges, you get some weather data, you get something else. That's where the utility and, and your overall addressable market completely exploded in terms of in, for, for internet. We have an intranet intranet for you know for many years before the open internet came into being but moment we started to connect all these various sources of information boom the 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 potential was mind boggling so now similar i think the idea is hey at the end of the day similar thing needs to happen on blockchain you can't have your own area and say, okay, you know, I'm gonna deal, only gonna deal with whatever happens in my blockchain. So now chain link is, is in this as well, which is like, wow. I'm like, okay, we still have to figure out how exactly this will work. But the whole idea is whoever owns will own this whole standard that is gonna be you know, whether most of the project will start moving to XEM from Polkadot or Chainlink CCIP or whatnot. I'm sure there will be more projects that uh, provide uh, or trying to, uh, are in this particular race, but uh, it's a pretty exciting one. On um, this, I think is the next growth opportunity for Chainlink to focus on is to become a universal interface to build a cross-chain app. So you write your smart contract as per this protocol, they'll have the converters, which will understand and convert it into whatever the other blockchain needs to understand it, right? It becomes a translator sort of a thing. 
I don't have to worry about if the other site is in Japanese or not. Chrome will take care of it, converting it. A crude example, but it's a similar stuff is, hey, they'll convert into different blockchains which talk in a different language. Chainlink become a common interpreter having two blockchains talk to each other. Immense, immense potential. So, so this makes me, uh, you know, a little more bullish and tried would want to keep eye on what's happening in the in the chain link world. It's not just Oracle. Uh, that itself was exciting, but now this whole keeper network and the CCIP is even more amazing. It's like a, uh, you know, icing on the cake. And the lastly, because we talked about chain link, is the, the verifiable random functions. Uh, again, this is. How do you make sure that you really generate a random value? And so, but you can use Chainlink for that. So that's all I wanted to talk about, spend a little more time on this new capability, couple of new capabilities, keepers and keeper network and the chain in the CCIP that I read about uh, for Chainlink uh, this week. So let me, any questions? Uh, what's your thought on this? Do you think this is exciting? Uh, or not, what do you think about it? Have you been involved in Chainlink? Looks like the developers, of course, uh, will get involved in Chainlink for building something that needs uh, some information from outside of your blockchain. You you have limited options. Chainlink is one of them. How about others? Uh, we'll look at a couple of questions meantime. As if to say, just connecting the dots here, that's what Chainlink does. It connects the dots. Sorry, <laughs> I'm just having some fun. So as more apps are built using Chainlink, does that mean more link tokens are mined? How do the coin become more valuable? So I think uh, when you actually, uh, for you to use, you probably have to pay, uh, again, I have to look into, and I will look deeper into the how the tokenomics work. But uh, my guess is that if you want to use a weather data, and James can correct you because if you yeah, want you to use a weather data from um, chain link, I have to pay in, in link tokens. So yeah, if you want to create a new, uh, if you want to have a new feed, um, if you if you just want to read, it's uh, you don't have to pay. Like for example, I just want to get the Ethereum, mm -hmm. uh, uh, right. like Ethereum die rate. I don't have to pay. But if I wanted to publish something, right? Oh. Um, that's one place where there's some revenue there and also uh, keepers, right? So if I'm running, um, if I have a keeper contract and then I want Chainlink to call into this contract periodically, then I got to keep some link um, inside the contract. So, so link, link will probably just pull from this contract period. Like every time there's a, there's a call that's made, um, they're just going to do a transfer from. So you, you approve mm -hmm. the link contract to essentially just transfer from your contract, right? So, and then your contract is the callback, essentially. So, um, yeah, so, so that's, that's where they're getting that from. And these, these link tokens are probably going to the nodes um, and, and probably a cut for the, for the link team. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but, but definitely the nodes. Because I mean, somebody has to. I mean, you have to pay these nodes, right? For 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 the trouble for the trouble of verifying and keeping everything running, right? Correct. Um, but they have to be incentivized for that. If there is no incentive, why would anyone do it? Yeah. the The problem right now is is the 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 way uh, a lot of these tasks are being run, right? Like whether it's like liquidations or just um, like settlement tasks or something. They're, they're typically uh, run using like something like uh, Open Zeppelin Defender, which which underneath uses Lambda, right? <laughs> like mm -hmm. Amazon AWS, like so. This, they're basically Lambda functions. Um, now, now the the problem with that is it it uh, it certainly is centralized, and also the um, you have to remember to actually run it, uh, right? Like if it crashes or something. Um, I mean, somebody gets paged, and then you have to go. It's it's like it's like uh, you're 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 it's like in-house DevOps, right? Mm -hmm. And then you you also uh, there's another system where it kind of incentivizes the public to go and call this function. Like I I don't know if you ever ever used PancakeSwap. 
I think. Oh, pancake swap? No, I've not used pancake swap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So pancake swap, I think, has um, like if you're if you're mining a yield farming or something, and then and then like the the vault accumulates a little bit of uh like like I don't know like rewards or fees or something mm -hmm. then anybody can go and make the call to accrue or distribute the rewards and then they actually get a little cut right and then that little counter just goes up until somebody clicks so it's kind of like a it's kind of like this game theory thing where um it's like you you're trying to because you're compensated a little bit but then you're you're gonna have to call this before somebody else so whoever is willing to accept the lowest bid essentially gets to call and then take the take that reward right so that's also a model but it's it's probably not as reliable as something like like link but the, the problem with keepers then is you're gonna have to make sure that there is enough link in the contract right so if it runs out of link then <laughs> then, then, you won't get then it stops yeah then yeah they won't get executed <laughs> Yeah, so so I mean, who's gonna be? I, I guess the team initially is gonna be responsible for topping up, but I guess uh, uh, the community eventually is gonna probably have to take that over if it becomes like a true DAO or like some kind of like, right. Yeah, I think uh, um, like these problems will, will will get solved, right? Eventually, these will will get solved. It's like. Uh, I'm trying to do run a transaction in Ethereum and hey, I didn't put enough gas, uh, com commit to pay enough gas. Now my transaction is, is held up. So I have to, what I have to do, go and, and change the gas in MetaMask. Okay, I will probably pay this much more of gas, right? So eventually these problems will get solved, um, but it's just starting off. So there are, uh, I think in my opinion, these are the like initial hiccups of any new thing that we're trying to do. Uh, yeah yeah so like yeah it's the same i mean the fees are typically i mean with with uh, ethereum everything is kind of pulled so like uh, same thing with flash loans so with a flash loan you you borrow the loan and then at the end of the execution you just leave enough in there plus the uh there's uh, i think nine basis points of what premium. Are the interest oh, nine, nine basis points or nine um, or nine basis points yeah um, and you keep so you keep the the principal and the premium or interest in the contract, and then when you terminate your function, the chain link or not chain link the Ave flash loan uh, contract is going to try to pull from your uh, contract. And if they can pull, they'll succeed. If they can't pull, they'll revert. They'll revert or the open way. a depth or, or open a depth position. So Ave the new Ave uh, now lets you actually accrue some debt. If you have collateral, <laughs> uh, if you, so like, no, if you have a collateral, yeah, your flash loan can actually turn into an actual loan. Like that's pretty wild. So, so typically in in the V one version, you're not going to be able to open up a debt position with a flash loan. Okay. In V two, they they're they, they actually allow you to do that, which I think oh. is pretty cool. That's very interesting. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah. many uh, use cases I think will come out, and this flash loan is completely mind boggling because there is nothing that exists. There is no parallel of it in the in our existing uh, infra, right? There is no lot of, of, of in our uh, what we call traditional tradfi. There is no parallel of tradfi in of flash loan. It is, exists only in in this crypto economy. It is pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think another question is is uh, how how to invest what what is this question like there is a disconnect between the um no, so oh, the actual token and the, the yes. protocol so this, itself this question is if this protocol becomes i mean what's the correlation between the value of link token and the um, usage of a protocol it really depends on what uh the token is is for right um i i guess uh there's usually a, a, a from based on what I've seen, right? Um, you you have tokens that that were pretty much just used to to raise money, right? So that in that case, your token is the token's not worth anything <laughs> afterwards, right? So th that is yeah. a possibility. I've seen projects that have done that where they they just use the tokens to kind of raise capital, and then yeah, that's it. 
Um, there's also another um, use case, like in the case of link, it could potentially be used as fees, right? Now, now why can't why can't they just accept ETH? Um, right? Like they could have, they could just also accept ETH, right? So um, I, I, that'd be probably be a little, a little more convenient. Although ETH you can't pull, so it's gonna have to be wrapped ETH. But still, anyway, that that's gonna be. At least with Link, you you do have that potential use case of, of fees, um, and then there's also governance, which is another um, good good use case for a token. Yeah, uh, I think where you, right? mostly I only become bullish if there is a like is to be used in fee, right? Only governance. Uh, it's okay, I'll control. But why would your token even? Be more valuable unless oh governance is you can't overlook governance because like for example like the no, notional right eventually it's going to have governance the thing about governance is you, you get you you get to control the corporate treasury think about it like think about uh like if you had a and this this isn't this is this is not even this is better than like like stock like shares i think like shares you kind of have control right uh, because uh, I mean, they they always say like like um, like shareholders like control the company. Well, kind of. You still have the board of directors and management, right? But okay. in the case of in the case of uh, uh, crypto, these tokens are really powerful. These governance tokens because they get to directly control the treasury um, with smart contracts. So this is not something that you can even say no to. Yeah. But um, doesn't it depend on in terms of what projects are how, you know, how their governance structure is is defined, right? For example, like for example, for example, we let, let me give an example, right? Like we we uh, when when we when Notional uh, starts uh, like V two launches, there's going to be um, like all the cash that's sitting there will be sitting inside uh, Compound, and mm -hmm. it'll be collecting the Compound yield plus the Comp token. Right. Right. Now, it, assuming that we got like what, like 100 million in there, let's just say. Right. So after a year, you're going to have two, three million dollars worth of comp token. Now, with governance, we can decide with governance, we can actually decide to turn the comp tokens into the notional our own uh, tokens and then burn those tokens uh, to increase the value of our own platform to right we can do that with governance so governance is actually really powerful it's not and this is something that can be done with contracts too this isn't like we don't even have to trust anybody to do this like this can be yeah. deployed with a contract and then we can use a dex to do the trade and then burn burn the the uh, right so everything can be set up ahead of time audited and then voted in right yeah, it is because i think you are doing the right way of using a, uh, you know giving this governance power to the holders of the token right for example now mm -hmm. there are many tokens that already exist you know i hold some in in many of these chains right let's say recently after the sec um started talking about uh, not sec or, there are some issue wherein uh, uh, Uniswap had to make some change. I don't know whether it was, was under regulatory pressure or something. Right? And Uniswap made a change pretty quickly. So now the question comes in, hey, if it was a decentralized exchange, if it needs to be, and what happens to those? What was the say of those people who were holding Uniswap token? Right? So that's like- No, Uniswap never made a change. To, to what? To the UI? No, there were, there were some- decks that had done a change and there was a lot of comments around what happens to the whole governance so there is a question started coming up yeah so i, I um, maybe it was on uniswap or something else right yeah first of all uniswap uh uh uniswap is is designed specifically in a way that's not really um is not really all that changeable like it's everything is pretty much set in stone. The only thing that governance can do is to enable like, uh, like the uh, the collection of, of the the like the 005 percent like mm -hmm. uh the, like fee or something. Um. So so Uniswap actually Uniswap governance is mostly just for 
allocating funds from the treasury. It's pretty much that's the only that is the, yeah. almost the only uh, use case for that. Exactly right. Um, so that's that's the only one. Uh, and now there are some other projects. Uh, Compound Compound is the one where the governance actually can execute code, uh, execute functions, and migrate things. Um, so so I. Or if, for example, if they take your vote in terms of where those treasury dollars be allocated to, which projects, right? You get to vote on those projects through the tokens that you hold. That's, again, one more portion of a governance is those shareholders or the token holders get to decide if I got a treasury for, uh, of, you know, 2 million tokens and there are projects going on, which project should I, should I fund? That's a part of the oh, yeah. not, yeah. not That's another okay. That's it. another. That's another topic because now we're kind of talking two things at the same time. One thing is like the ability for governance to control the treasury. The other, the other topic is how to efficiently allocate that capital. Now, my my, I think my answer to that is initially it's not going to be efficient because we're yeah. still like roughing it out, right? So initially it's going to be probably extremely so either extremely wasteful or it's not gonna be enough, right? So um, so I think it's gonna take a while before people kind of get a hang of how to actually do this governance thing correctly. Like if you look at recently, there's been a lot of proposals that are just like garbage, right? You're paying people a bunch of money for nothing, basically, mm -hmm. um, right? So so that's gonna happen for a, for a while, right? Because we, we don't, I mean, because you, you have to get people to, to care enough about some of these protocols to actually go and vote. And, and Ethereum is also really expensive to use. So sometimes people don't even vote, right? Yeah. So um, yeah, I, I, I think it's going to take some time to get there. I, I don't Absolutely. Think I think that would be the nirvana uh, wherein, you know, it becomes um, the, the holders get to decide the direction of the company. Now, when it's a direction of the company, like I said, there are multiple areas in which you could vote with your uh, with the power of your tokens. Could be treasury functions, could be uh, anything else. I think in some cases, it also decides on uh, what percentage of yield or, or uh, you know, what's the liquidity of any provide liquidity, you know, how much of a percentage of your, uh, you should earn off a transaction fee. That's also can be decided by governance, but it's pretty yeah. exciting topic. And you're exactly yeah. right that this is not thought of as, as the one of the most important, but I think if the trust has to increase, if this whole crypto economy has to survive, governance will be one of the most important um, factor in that we will yeah and we're probably not going to get it right like immediately that's it's yeah, going to yeah. take some yeah, yeah. time I, I i feel like uh we'll, we'll have to and i mean in terms of uh voting so not not really always developers so i get this question how do people vote um so not always developers but obviously um if it's like something that's highly technical right because sometimes uh if the if the voting is 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 more or less i mean because not every proposal is the same right so like for example maybe this proposal is should we add like another asset to to this protocol like right now like for example notional only supports ethereum and, and bitcoin uh should we add a usdc and die like should we add usdt for example right Right. So that that question, that's at least I think most people can understand. So that that question uh, is probably going to get debated, and then and then anybody can essentially vote. You don't have to be a developer to necessarily uh, know the the consequences of adding USDT, right? So like that that that's a more sort of like down to earth type of proposal. But there might be other like another type of proposal where we're upgrading the protocol completely, like we're putting in new code. Yeah, that's a little bit tricky to, for like some somebody who's not a developer to actually go and read the code and, and try to figure out if that's the right move, right? Um, so, so I think in, in that case, it's, it's more or less gonna be delegated 
or proxy voting. It's kind of like in real in the real world where you have proxy voting, right? For like companies where you don't yeah, understand yeah, what the heck exactly. is going That's on. What, I was about to say it's a parallel in the real world, right? We get so many of the uh, time, you know, oh, you got to vote on this. I understand some of it, half of it I won't understand, but then I'll see, okay, what does the board recommend? Or what does the ISI recommend? I'll, I'll go with this. Or, uh, you know, right now in the in in the traditional world, there is no way for me to delegate. But I think that could be an option in the crypto economy where I can, wherein I can delegate my voting rights to someone else who I may trust. Uh, you know, again, completely just throwing out of the blue is instead of me trying to do everything of my own, it's just like instead of me trying to mine it, I'll basically, uh, or instead of me trying to become a validator, I will delegate uh, the token which I have onto another stake pool operator or to another validator. Uh, maybe I can do similar thing with governance. Oh, we'll have to see. But yeah, yeah, Compound allows you to delegate, and we also because we're we're forking the Compound governance uh, contract, oh, okay. so we also them. allow you to delegate. Yeah, so like, uh, yeah, so if you don't. Um, know what's going on. Uh, I mean, if it's a proposal that you can understand, I mean, by all means, go and vote uh, individually, right? Don't yeah. you don't have to delegate. But then, if it's something that's re like pretty technical, it's it's not something that you think is is something that you can understand. Then delegating is is a potential solution there. So, I see another question. It seems to me that each protocol project should have a consortium of some sort to involve business and legal people. Uh, so I think th there are uh, there are many of these decentralized sorry not decentralized yeah, yeah uh, decentralized uh, autonomous organization right wherein it is decentralized you don't have really a named head named CEO and now some of those projects are actually getting legally registered I don't recall but I think one of the uh, states Probably it may be Wyoming, which is very forward and crypto friendly state, probably recognizes these DAOs as LLCs or, you know, considered as, as like, like any other corporations. So again, very early in this one, but I guess um, it, there will be some legal structure, et cetera, that because if you have to trade, I mean, you're a DAO, but then you're trading with something which is on the on the real world. Then we gotta have that legal structure in place. So anyway, pretty early, but I completely agree, James. This governance is governance is like I would say in a traditional applications building. When an engineer is building it, we don't think about how the UI will look like, how the documentation will be. We'll <laughs> worry about it later, <laughs> and uh, uh, mostly around the docs. So this was governance is, hey, let's get the project out. But this is one of very important thing that every crypto project should be focused on. Yeah, I would love to, To I mean, in a couple of years, I, I kind of see myself just working for like different DAOs. And, and I do think DAOs will become pretty big. And, and I think a lot of these crypto projects and DeFi projects, I think that the DAO structure is really the um, kind of the optimal structure mm -hmm. for, for managing it. So um, it, it's gonna get get there, right? I, I think it's gonna take a few years. I don't think it's gonna be trivial, um, <laughs> right? Um, but yeah. Yeah, interesting one. All right, so that's uh, already sent 54. We'll be beyond our time. Um, so thank you for, thank you everyone for, for joining here for some exciting discussion around Cross chain linking and what chain link is trying to do over there. So it's not only Polkadot, it's not only some of the other protocols, but this Oracle provider is also becoming big in being a glue or like Zifty says, let's connecting the dots between different blockchains. So, so I was excited when I read through it. I thought I'll share uh, with you guys today. All right, uh, let's uh, stop right here. Um,